All right, so um, as scholars formulate race beyond the black-white binary, the category of honorary whites has been both informative and elusive. Sociologist Eduardo Benita Silva posits three main racial categories that for the contemporary US, whites, honorary whites, and the collective black. Uh, whites and collective blacks represent the binary poles of race and racism. We kind of know that. The collective black in this formulation that he has refers to African Americans, dark-skinned Latinos, Native Americans, struggling Asian Americans, for instance, Hmong Americans, and dark-skinned African immigrants. Honorary whites uh, include Chinese, Indian, Korean, Japanese Americans, light-skinned Latinos, and Middle Eastern Americans. They are minorities who approximate or even surpass whites in terms of their adaptation, in terms of major categories that we measure for how well an immigrant group is adapting to the United States. That is, for instance, median incomes, um, levels of educational attainment, residential integration, uh, health care outcomes, um, and even identification with whites, right? O more so than with other minorities. Bonilla Silva says that they can experience racism, these honorary whites, such as Arab American discrimination post 9 11, right? Um, he goes on to say that they help maintain. Uh, the, basically, there are tools for white supremacy, for they exist between blacks and whites and help buffer racial conflict. Okay. But what relevance race has for those classified as honorary whites is unclear, given their significant integration. It's an assertion that he makes that such minorities affirm white supremacy and are racially maligned, rather than, rather than an agreed upon fact. All right. When I'm using the term honorary whites today, I'm referring to his typology. Um, specifically. How should we understand the meaning and relevance of race for minorities who approach or even surpass whites along key measures of mobility, seemingly far removed from any substantial notions of racial disfranchisement? Are they a sign of the continued white supremacy as suggested by Bonilla Silva and other critical race scholars? Or is their social, cultural, economic integration a sign of blurred boundaries and assimilation with whites, as others contend. We cannot fully understand how race works overall without understanding the experiences of this growing segment of uh, minorities. I invoke and elaborate on the concept of honorary whiteness in order to offer a more comprehensive approach to understanding such groups, to elucidate how to think the, of the meaning and relevance of race uh, for this category. I have focused mostly on Asian Americans today whose class backgrounds give them economic privileges alongside middle class whites. So I'm talking about a particular niche of Asian Americans. And I'm going to connect this notion of honorary whiteness to the racialization of, of Asian Americans. Before elaborating on the concept of honorary whiteness, I want to briefly explain why I am privileging his formulation of race and racial categories. Other formulations offer many key insights of racial inequality, but less so for minorities that are quite integrated. For instance, Evelyn O'Connell Glenn has argued for a conception of race that recognizes settler colonialism alongside the racialization of African Americans and others. She highlights how displacement and dispossession shape racial injustices. Yet, how contemporary integrated minorities, for instance, Chinese Americans, affluent Chinese Americans, which she references in passing in the article, experience race is not really addressed. Uh, similarly, Julian Goh argues effectively that post-colonialism, as to our understanding of U.S. racial inequality, for it provides an historical formulation of race as an imperial project. Here again, the ideal type of a racial minority group is one that experiences clear inequalities relative to whites in the nation, which this honorary white category does not fit. Other frameworks offer definitions of race that allow integrated minorities to be a racialized uh, minority group. Sorry, integrated minority. Uh, but their examples of how racism works does not, does not encompass their experiences. Again, for people whose incomes or educational attainments or, or other measures, not necessarily on par with whites, but even surpass uh, white medians. Right. Omin why not? offer an approach to understanding race that is expansive, not limited to, limited to one kind of racial inequality. But as others have argued, they talk more about how 
race is constructed than about racism right, and its relevance uh, for different kinds of groups. Non-conceptualize a minority category, category fitting for those who approximate or even surpass uh, whites on key social categories. I'm not dismissing these formulations. I will draw upon them, but they do not uh, approximate honorary whiteness as um, sufficient. And yet the conception of honorary whiteness remains under-theorized, with attention mostly to those on the collective black scale of the binary. In what ways and how does race matter for these groups? Right? It's not a self-evident question. Bonilla Silva's discussion of honorary whites paints them as practically beyond racism, for it paints, for it spends most of his time documenting their achievements. As I mentioned before, he cites anti-Arab American discrimination, hate crimes and the like post-9-11 as evidence of how honorary whites are not beyond race. But how such anti-Arab discrimination can sit alongside their elevated educational status and social economic status is not explained. Rather than focus on the significance of race for honorary whites, research on the concept has instead studied whether groups classified as honorary whites have racial attitudes more similar to whites and to blacks and such. I'm not going to speak on that because uh, it, you know, it doesn't really, it's not that controversial and it basically argues that this notion of honorary whiteness exists. But even with consensus, the so-called honorary white uh, minorities are distinct from other minorities, the more fundamental question of the relevance and meaning of race for them is unanswered. For instance, Asian Americans are racialized as foreigners, but also the out-white whites, quote unquote. And how this can happen simultaneously is not explained. In other words, research has not explained the conundrum of simultaneous white supremacy and the achievements of integrated minorities. Instead, literature responds to this paradox by concentrating on for instance, Asian Americans' experiences with either discrimination or integration. The tendency has been a debate between two opposing sides, right? one arguing for the significance of Orientalism and race, and the other side arguing for the lack of any kind of meaningful racialized experience. As Lee and Kai put it for Asian Americans in a, in a review article of the literature on Asian American sociology, ultimately we argue that it's time for theoretical perspectives on Asian Americans to move past binary frameworks of assimilation or racialization as mutually exclusive outcomes. So the evidence we have reviewed suggests the possibility and indeed the likelihood that processes of assimilation and racialization are occurring simultaneously for Asian American groups today. So it's not just me telling you this. This amazing review article tells you the same thing. Today I take up this challenge of moving past binary frameworks. I want to briefly review this binary notion in order to demonstrate how, demonstrate how race is currently framed for these groups. And then I spend the bulk of this presentation explaining how the concept of honorary whiteness, once properly fleshed out, can help reconcile the seeming binary. So one side of this debate <coughs> excuse me, of Asian Americans and race aligns them with the collective black. That they experience a clear racialization as minorities at the hands of whites in the nation, making them connected, connected to the collective black, even as they experience race differently. Such literature explains that they are unlike and unequal to whites, despite their seeming socioeconomic integration achievements. For instance, the model minority stereotype marginalizes African, uh, Asian Americans uh, and African Americans. Beyond its racist implications, the stereotype hides the heterogeneity of the race. For instance, many Asian Americans experience uh, high poverty rates. Right? Ethnographic accounts of the so-called model minority reveal constant questions of their belonging to the nation. Questions like, where are you really from? Right? Assumptions about robotic personalities and concerns about a glass ceiling. So behind these broad statistical measures of their integration, you see a real experiences of being seen as constant foreigners. The model minority transforms into the Orientalist yellow peril when Asian Americans become too successful and threaten white privilege. The notion that Asian Americans experience racism as perpetual foreigners has been well documented. For instance, they may have residential integration with whites but are made to feel that they do not belong culturally. 
as they alter the physical and linguistic landscapes of suburbs. Hate crimes against Asian Americans as foreigners are not uncommon, right? There's multiple instances of, instances of this, and we're seeing different versions of this currently. The micro and macro uh, levels of acts of discrimination against Asian Americans affirm the fact that the U.S. is not a welcoming nation, right, but an imperial one with Asians that migrate and work within rather than enjoy the full notions of citizenship. Minorities might move up the racial hierarchy by committing to whitening themselves and distancing themselves from African Americans, but racism still pervades their experiences. Real, unequ uh, real equality necessitates solidarities between honorary whites and African Americans, which are more common than uh, normally assumed. So one side of this binary, the relevance of race for integrated minorities, contends that they are less economically successful than we assume, less socially integrated and accepted than we assume, and they're mostly treated as non-whites through the lens of Orientalism. They are distinct from but connected to the collective black as people of color within a white supremacist nation. Right? That's the one argument, one side of this quote unquote debate. The other side of the debate contends that Asian Americans are blurring the boundaries with whites, so much so that an assimilation, if not a foregone conclusion, at least would not be surprising. To support this claim, scholars point to major uh, elements of integration. Asian Americans and other immigrant experience more residential integration, interracial marriages with whites, economic mobility, and identification with whites the more time they spend in the United States. So in other words, the challenges they face are a function of their immigration rather than a function of race. When honorary whites live in neighborhoods with a large concentration of co-ethnics, it's mostly by choice rather than a lack of opportunities. There are few, if any, barriers, according to this side of the argument, right, for, to their socioeconomic equality with whites. A glass ceiling or bamboo ceiling is a very contested notion. There's a lot of evidence suggesting that it's not there. Right? So if race and racism were so meaningful to their lives, you wouldn't see such major indicators. Such arguments do not contend that there is no racism against Asian Americans, but that such acts are not institutionalized nor impactful at the group level that they ease over time. It's a crueler version, maybe, of the anachronistic and hopefully harmless stereotype of the Irish drunk. It exists, and it's unfortunate, but it doesn't really bear on their livelihoods. Under such assimilation formulations, blacks still suffer from racism. Right? Many honorary whites are very close to, if not part of, whiteness. How much race matters to them could be quite little. So we are left with the question of how much race and racism matter for integrated minorities like honorary whites. To get past this debate of whether race matters or not uh, for many Asian Americans, we must adopt a fuller approach to conceptualizing the relevance of race. Honorary whiteness is a useful category to explain this, but it needs to be, needs to be properly formulated for it is not clear what the status really means. All right. I hope to can accomplish two interconnected goals. The first is to conceptualize the relevance of race for honorary whites. That is, this uh, paper explains honorary whites within a racial system. Beyond questioning their individual experiences with racism or other forms of marginalization as normally performed by race scholars. Specifically, I'm going to explain how honorary whites encounter the social structure in a way that undermines the collective blacks and lets them approximate whiteness while still upholding a white supremacy that keeps them apart. This conception of how race matters for integrated minorities differs from a critical race approach, which argues, as I mentioned earlier, the relevance of race by demonstrating how integrated minorities are clearly disenfranchised relative to whites. In my conception, finding honorary whites to be on par with whites makes sense. The second goal is to use this expanded conception of honorary whiteness to explain how many Asian Americans experience race and in so doing reconcile the aforementioned binary debate. Race matters for Asian Americans when their practices and experiences contribute to their disenfranchisement of collective blacks and maintain white supremacy, which will entail proximity to whites but not complete equality. 
I'm going to draw from existing literature and also offer some uh, data that I've collected on integrated minorities. I contend that the uh, concept of honorary whiteness um, can help us explain uh, this binary. I argue that Asian Americans fit within a racial ideologies and structure in ways that allow for their social economic achievements and mark them as foreigners with the effects of perpetuating anti-black racism and upholding white supremacy. In contrast to the research on racialization of Asian Americans, it should not be surprising to find ample evidence of their economic, social, and cultural integration that supports anti-black racism and maintains the foundations of white supremacy. So their proximity to whites does not signal the declining significance of race or their assimilation. Uh, I'll show this first through attention to their place within racial ideologies and then their place within social institutions Named the, labor, named the labor market and education. So I'm now going to move away from, move from this kind of broader formulations to giving you actual evidence of their place in a racial system. I look first at racial ideologies. The goal of this section is to explain how the cultural stereotypes of Asian Americans support ideologies that perpetuate anti-blackness and white supremacy. Asian Americans are framed along two Main, sorry. Uh, two uh, dimensions: superior, inferior, and insider, outsider. Through the model minority stereotype, they are valorized as superior to blacks and comparable to whites. They are presumed to be academically minded, hardworking, unlikely to commit crimes. These are all kind of notions you are probably familiar with, right? Beyond being a misleading descriptor of Asian Americans, the stereotype also reinforces the subjugation of the collective black. It perpetuates colorblind ideology. The United States has moved past its racist, uh, past its racist history and is treating people as individuals rather than as subordinate groups. As such, the stereotype disciplines blacks. It's no coincidence that the stereotype arose during the time of the Civil Rights Movement, for instance. Asian Americans, as the model minority, will not be conflated with blacks. So we see that it makes sense for them to be seen as relative to whites within a system that oppresses other minorities. The yellow peril notion kicks in when Asian Americans appear to be too successful and to threaten white supremacy. The cultural stereotype upholds white supremacy and keeps honorary whites separate and unequal. As Andrea Smith argues, it does so by being based on Orientalist assumptions that the West is morally, intellectually, and technologically superior to the East. The West must engage in war in order to protect itself from conquest by the East and to spread its enlightened status to these backwards others. Orientalism frames Asian Americans as non-whites, while doing so allows the US to exercise military, economic, and cultural power over foreign groups, including when those foreign groups are U.S. citizens. As such, the yellow peril upholds whiteness as natural. The forever foreigner designation not only supports Orientalism, but also racialized capitalism, and with that, within that, the ide ideology of nationalism. Asian Americans are utilized for their labor and so help capitalism, but are maligned as foreigners and so uphold the nation as a white entity. That is, they resolve the contradiction between capitalism and nationalism. So such, such a cultural framing supports white nationalist ideology, that whites are the true owners of the nation and true patriots. The low peril stereotype never goes away, but it becomes more evident when white Americans feel threatened by Asian Americans. Drawing off um, sociologist Herbert Bloomer, we would expect the dominant stereotype sorry, this dormant stereotype to become activated when whites feel that their group is status is uh, under, th under threat. And multiple historical examples confirm this. Right? Um, these include, but are not, not limited to, China's exclusion laws, the internment of, large scale internment of, of Japanese Americans, in contrast to how uh, German and Italian Americans were, were treated. You're having a talk here in a couple of days about Japanese American internment. The murder of Vincent Chin, post 9 11 hate crimes and surveillance, uh, H-1 visa curtailments, the proposed Muslim ban, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So what's the point? 
Um, the cultural stereotype applied to Asian Americans makes sense within a racial system that uses Asian Americans to uphold uh, white supremacy and to subjugate the collective black. Right? Asian Americans can be socially and culturally accepted if they demonstrate themselves to be patriotic and non-threatening, which remains something to be proved rather than assumed. Moving on to racial institutions. Okay, I'll talk about, talk about the labor market and then education. Again, the goal here is to demonstrate that how Asian Americans fit in within these institutions makes sense once understood as within a racial system, as opposed to arguing that they are or are not experiencing racism per se. Race takes place across institutions um, that we take for granted as part of our day-to-day -day lives. I'll focus on labor market and education, and within those, a few cases. Within the labor, labor market, honorary whites should, should accrue resources at the expense of African Americans and others. It's like the model minority stereotype gives them praise at the expense of African Americans and other minorities. At the same time, they should not threaten white supremacy or white-run capitalism without significant pushback from whites. Their practices will uphold whites' privileged status within institutions, which they will be reminded of through racist rhetoric and practices when they threaten whites' privileged statuses. I explicate what it means to be an honorary white in the labor market through analysis of Asian Americans as small business owners and then within white collar professions, uh, physicians and H-1B visa workers. Okay. In the process of seemingly contradictory ex economic achievements on the one hand and racial discrimination on the other hand are explained. Integrated minorities or honorary whites and small business owners should run businesses often at the expense of blacks, and should not threaten white supremacy or white-run capitalism. Asian Americans' frequent status, status as middlemen minorities fits this positionality. They run businesses that depend on poor, often minority clientele, while benefiting white-run capitalism within a racial hierarchy. Middlemen minority businesses arise in areas with entrenched racial hierarchies, where minority groups lack many retail options. A prime example of this historically has been Korean Americans. They've held a variety of family-run businesses, such as grocery stores, liquor stores, restaurants, dry cleaners, and more. Within some urban uh, inner cities, uh, they took over businesses from other immigrants that serve primarily African Americans and Latinos. White suppliers benefit from such small-scale stores, so they can reach markets they otherwise would not. While often exaggerated in the media, Racial tensions between black customers and Korean American store owners have ensued, as store owners were seen as capitalizing on the marginal conditions of African Americans. Such resentment between minorities and white business, uh, sorry, between minorities benefits white business owners and politicians. So the position of integrated minorities as middlemen minorities makes sense, right? But that fits their role within the racial system, within the labor market. Some entrepreneurs have made significant progress through small business ownership. Their achievements and challenges also make sense once viewed through the lens of honorary whiteness. Indian American motel owners began with a middleman minority situation. In the 1940s and 50s, these Indian American owners started in the industry serving uh, poor customers with extended stay hotels um, in rundown areas of San Francisco and other major cities. Over time, these Indian Americans came to dominate the lower to mid hospitality market. Even if owners have uneven financial returns, for the most part they can afford to put their kids through college, thereby facilitating financial security for the next generation. It's no surprise that the media, corporate leaders, and politicians applaud them as the American dream incarnate. Right? So again, it's not surprising that we see honorary whites doing quite well because they're doing so often at the expense of other minorities within a system that is racially stratified. Such achievements differentiate them from the, from the collective black, but still reinforce and threaten aspects of white supremacy. These Indian American motel owners uphold white-led corporations that depend on the willingness of Indian immigrants to open and expand their businesses. Indian owners complain that they're taken advantage of by these corporations 
as immigrants with two other professional options. For the most part, these Indian owners have remained in the lower market sector, marked by low returns and stiff competition. When they seem to pressure the privileged group status of white owners, a pushback follows. White owners argue that they are unprofessional, weakening the industry, and the like. White owners install American-owned and operated signs uh, in order to demonstrate that their hotels are not Indian-owned. Importantly, while racial incidents reinforce the white stature, both as competitors and as ruling capitalists, it does not mean that individual owners will complain about racism or experience impediments to their mobility. As they serve corporate and government entities, they will be rewarded. They are blurring boundaries with whites given their success, but without, uh, and because they're helping developers, but without overcoming a marginalized status. Here's an example of what an American owned and operated sign um, looks like. Right. So again, you'll experience this kind of pushback even as they move up within a racial hierarchy. I want to turn to a different form of labor market, white collar professionals. I'll be looking at physicians. And how their experiences also make sense within a racial system's perspective. Physicians were encouraged to immigrate to the US in order to serve communities neglected within the healthcare system, namely blacks and whites in urban centers and in rural stretches, a trend that continues today. Rather than invest in the education and training of African Americans and others in the collective black category, immigrants were brought in as a solution to a shortage. In the process, they benefited white physicians. The immigrants took residences in positions that most white physicians did not want. And they became privileged for higher paying and higher status options. They also entered peripheral specializations left open by whites. So the growth of the immigrant doctor reinforces the positionality of both the dependent collective black and the entitled credentialed white. Immigrants generally have found success under the system. It's not surprising that many physicians blur the boundaries of whiteness with financial and social statuses afforded them. If they perform well and earn the respect of more established white colleagues, they might be able to move up to better jobs. And yet, when such immigrants seem to threaten the privileged status of whites, they receive pushback as inferior foreigners with significant but not complete effectiveness. Such pushback happens discursively, for instance. For decades, immigrant physicians were referred to as FMGs, foreign medical graduates, a term uh, used for any immigrant physician, even if educated partly in the United States, and not used to refer to US born and raised physicians who attended medical school abroad. Immigrant physicians encountered clear discrimination in the 1980s and 90s, and is arguably still today. Right? For instance, they had to take stricter exams than the US trained doctors. And it became widely held belief that they provided poorer care despite any physical evidence of that. The American Medical Association lobbied US Congress to limit the number of immigrant doctors, which it did in 1976, despite some major cities still lacking sufficient numbers. In these ways, the key institutions around the occupation worked to affirm this racial status quo. Rather than frame immigrant physicians as somewhat successful and somewhat discriminated against, we learn more by framing them within a racial system. Individual immigrant physicians enjoy relatively high status and incomes, residential integration, and ensuing privileges within a healthcare system premised on racial inequalities for the collective black. But they work within a physician system that supported their white peers and try to keep them within a secondary status. Some might move up, right? Well, many others do not. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over this next description of H-1B visa workers and get to the section on education, the last institution. This is really great stuff. You're really missing out. You're really missing out. <laughs> the bottom example of how honorary whiteness explains groups' experiences uh, within a social institutions involves education. Asian Americans are known for their general, not uniform, educational attainment. 
the model minority stereotype finds popular support because of certain Asian Americans' scholastic achievements relative to other minorities, even as achievements often stem from their class advantages. Importantly for the concept of honorary whiteness, this success is not just in contrast to many African Americans, but is framed as in resistance to them. Uh, for instance, uh, Min Jo and Carl Bankston uh, argue that Vietnamese Americans in New Orleans who avoid the cultural norms of local blacks and stay within their own ethnic group succeed more in school. Right? This is part of a more expansive trend, this argument is part of a more expansive trend to interpret urban African Americans as oppositional towards school. And I'm drawing, thinking of the work of John Ogbu and others who have made this argument. This value-based argument has been well challenged, right? Even as we still see differences in scholastic performance between Asian Americans and blacks in schools. In addition to unequal cultural framings, honorary whites accrue resources at the expense of other minorities. That's, their, that's how they fit within a racial system. For instance, Asian Americans enjoy a stereotype promise that is assumed to be <clears throat> academically committed and adept, especially in STEM fields. Conversely, African Americans suffer from a stereotype threat. That is a self-perception influenced by educators that they are inferior academically. These varying images influence how teachers treat students, which has major impacts on their academic performance. Asian Americans are given more academic opportunities than blacks and Latinos. This happens as they have access to small classes, uh, advanced classes, higher level tracking, and the benefit of doubt in their assignments. Within the zero sum of school budgets, resources to such Asian Americans happen at the expense of the collective black. Asian Americans' achievements blur the boundaries with whites and can be read, assign, read as a sign of their equity with whites. Whites applaud their successes, even more so when they can benefit from them. For instance, white families looking to advance their children's education turn to Asian immigrant spaces. You'll see this in Asian Americans may start this cram school, they're called. And you'll see some white families take advantage of that. If honorary whiteness is a useful lens to interpret such Asian Americans' experiences in school, then we would predict for them to encounter resistance from whites if they threaten white sense of entitled status within schools, and that's what we see. It is one thing for Asian Americans to do well relative to other minorities. That's applauded as proving a colorblind ideology. Right? But when scholastic achievements come at the expense of whites, it represents a foreign invasion of corrupt morals. For instance, the image of the Asian whiz kid has been replaced by that of the mean tiger mom. White families complain when educational norms in their neighborhood change as a result of Asian immigration. And we're seeing this, for instance, in uh, suburbs of San Francisco and New Jersey and elsewhere. Families in school districts frame Asian immigrant children as studious but unable to assimilate. There is a new white flight happening from neighborhoods with too many Asian Americans. I have conducted research on affluent Asian American families who pursue what I call hyper-education for their young kids. That is, their preschool to middle-aged children take part in after-school education, like spelling bee competitions, math classes, math competitions, even though they are already excelling in school and they're in well-resourced public schools or private schools. There is a, there's no meaningful reason to pursue more education, and yet these families are doing so. That's the population I've, I've been studying. Right? Uh, teachers and administrators of these affluent, high-performing school districts in the Boston suburbs, suburbs where I did my research, where whites and Asian Americans are the largest demographic groups, spoke of the problems that ensued from Asian Americans prioritizing academics so much. They are blamed for stress and insecurity among whites. One administrator explained it this way. You have a confluence of things happening in this country of people coming into the country, some of them for the education specifically, coming with their cultural perspective of what they think is appropriate and how things should be 
putting pressure on the school districts. And you also have the kindergarten to college route that is also in place, and that's getting more and more selective. Here, the pressure that white middle class and upper middle class families face in regards to education is blamed primarily on the culture of Asian Americans, and only secondly on major changes in higher education and the labor market. Self-assured of their parenting styles are normative, educators feel emboldened to criticize to the students the cultural influence of their parents. There was a preventative prevention specialist of the school district, someone whose job it is is to help teach uh, children in the school district how to make healthy choices when faced with stress or the opportunity for drinking and drugs or whatever else it might be. She said, I had a student who was Indian in my office every day, anxious about going home and facing his father, worried about college. I saw him over four years. I saw the toll that it took on him. I was on him all the time. I'm not your mother, but I am your mother. He skipped over pieces of, childhood, of a childhood that no child should have to do. I had the opportunity to get to know kids. I can tell them messages. They ask, am I nuts? And I say, no, you're not nuts. Everyone else here is around here. With her good intentions in mind, she refers to herself as a type of mother to the student and wants to get at the source of the foreign contagion that is hurting all of the children in the school, the home parenting. She aims to give students a version of childhood she deems appropriate, right? One denied to them by overpressuring parents who are ridiculed as nuts. White professional families do not always demonstrate restraint and concern around strong investment in academics. In schools with mostly blacks and white students, white parents often advocate for their children to receive academic resources. They argue for their kids to be in advanced tracks, for admissions to honors or AP classes, for extra support from teachers and the like. But when Asian Americans do the same at the expense of whites, it's a cause of concern. A white U.S. born mother in an affluent Boston area district with many Asian Americans said, but we do know Asian American parents who are calling the schools and saying, my kid is more advanced than you realize, and he's going to be advanced, and he's going to be starting this this year, whatever advanced class that is. And they, then they find out, or we find out, that they got their private tutors over the summer, and they had them take online classes over the summer. It seems unfair that Asian Americans should get advanced classes if they're doing coursework over the summer. Indicative of the power white families have in local school districts, administrators are responding to their concerns. This is an example from New Jersey, Princeton, New Jersey area, uh, within the past couple of years. Right? Districts are siding with white families and are cutting back on homework, instilling relaxation days, doing yoga, and the like. Right? They're changing schoolwork policies to suit the preferences of white parents, and to uh, much of the chagrin of Asian American parents. So it's fitting, fitting honorary white status, getting back to this concept. Asian Americans are applauded when their success upholds a colorblind ideology. And a few concerns are raised for those marginalized as a result. They receive the benefits of a stereotype promise and earn a national reputation. But when their achievement comes at the expense of well-networked whites and their sense of group position, what they think, where they should be in the status hierarchy. It is read as a foreign invasion, and efforts are mobilized to contain it. Through surrogate parenting and calling other parents nuts, right, through school districts. Administrators critique the parenting styles, and it's just cracked down on the competition. Honorary whites may continue to out-white whites in education, but the system changes to curtail the benefits of doing so. All right, conclusion. Then. Our current theorization of race and racism has been defined most broadly within a binary framework. By this binary framework, I do not mean that we do not distinguish between varying, varying types of racism. We do. We know that Asian Americans are racialized as Orientalist foreigners. While African Americans, Latinos are racialized differently. Native Americans differently. The binary I'm referring to is in thinking of whether race is active or not, that binary question. Race is supposedly active 
when minorities are clearly unequal from whites along median income, returns on education, residential integration, healthcare outcomes, et cetera, acceptance within local communities. With this in mind, uh, sorry, with this in mind, race and racism are active for integrated minorities when they are negatively distinguished from whites. And we refer to the declining significance of race, that popular phrase, when they approximate whiteness, right? When they have no glass ceiling, when there's no hate crimes. With such a formulation in mind, the debate has been to what degree Asian Americans experienced racism relative to whites and to what degree are they integrated with them, as that um, binary reference mentioned. The concept, the concept of ordinary whiteness could provide a formulation of race that interprets groups' experiences within a racial system. And it was passed as either or framing that still dominates the literature. The concept has been neglected and so of little theoretical value, which I hope I have um, made more relevant here today. The analytical questions for Asian Americans and other groups should not be to what degree they fit into whiteness or the nation or are excluded from them. Equality with whites along social, cultural, and economic measures does not mean the declining significance of race. Instead, analyses of the racialization of integrated minorities should focus on their, how their role within racial ideologies and institutions maintain the disfranchisement of minorities and white supremacy, even when members have reached some parity with whites. The enforcement of white supremacy is not in contradiction to their mobility, but often goes hand in hand. That is, a proper framework must, be, must analyze integrated minorities within a racial system relative to blacks, whites, and the nation, rather than assessing their degree of individual, individual level disenfranchisement or equality with whites. While honorary whiteness is a useful category, the notion that it exists within a racial hierarchy with whites and blacks misrepresents how race works. The term racial hierarchy privileges the white-black binary and asks where on the linear hierarchy of whiteness, of blackness, and ethnic group resides. Asian Americans and other groups experience race differently, as I've already explained and as you already know, right, and play a distinct role in the maintenance of white supremacy. Okay. Future research should concentrate on those members of the supposed honorary whites who don't enjoy the privileges I've assumed here. For instance, almost 17% of Chinese immigrants live in poverty. The national, that's above the national rate of 15% as of 2015. The number of Chinese, Korean, and Indian Americans who are undocumented has grown exponentially over the past 10 years. How well they fit a category of honorary whiteness is an open question. Finally, how women and men experience race differs. With more and more attention should be placed on the specific racialization of Asian American women, for instance, as nurses, relative to Asian American men, for instance, as physicians, and how gender complicates any clear understanding of honorary whiteness. Thank you very much.